sort of have a roundtable of dialogue about this, but I think these are important points because we're at a critical juncture um, with regard to the False Claims Act, which was sort of revitalized in 1986, and then there were two additions, two amendments to the False Claims Act in the last two years. And if you talk to um, most whistleblower lawyers, false claims lawyers, they will tell you that the statute has brought these incredible results. And I thought what we talked about was the question of whether that is really true. Should we be congratulating ourselves for our success in the False Claims Act, or should we be raising questions about whether it's being implemented and effectuated by, I guess, false claims lawyers and whistleblowers in an appropriate manner? Um, since 1986, um, the Justice Department claims credit for recovering about $20 billion uh, under the Federal False Claims Act. And yet, if you were to talk to the Assistant or Deputy Attorney General of the United States, uh, he would report to you, as he did to Congress last year, that they estimate that there's between $30 and $60 billion in Medicare and Medicaid fraud alone. Um, now, it used to be that I thought about these false claims cases is somewhat inconsequential when you talk about the entire federal budget, which is in the trillions of dollars, but many of you recall in February of this year, we faced a government shutdown over a debate over $30 billion. And when we came back to sort of revisit the budget question earlier in the summer, uh, there was much debate over trimming $400 billion. And as Dr. Poplin and I'm sure Paul Lawrence and Tracy Bushner and Cyrus can tell you that the pharmaceutical industry alone over the last 10 or 15 years has uh, caused the government probably to spend uh, hundreds of billions of dollars in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in wasted in wasted resources. And not only is it a question of spending money on drugs that aren't needed, but it's also the issue of spending drug money on the drugs that, that cause injury and illness, uh, which force the government to uh, expend more money for treatment. So, you know, I, I guess I sort of will pose the overarching question to Paul. I stated this premise about the statute probably not working. I mean, is it, you know, am I, am I off base? Um, have I, am I too negative and not optimistic and, and don't give enough credit where credit's due, or are there real issues here? Well, I, I would have to <clears throat> agree that uh, the percentage of the fraud that's out there that's been uh, remedied under the False Claims Act is probably really low. If you do a back of the envelope calculation, uh, I come up with maybe 4% of what happens maybe is corrected through QUITAM uh, cases under the False Claims Act. Um, I, I do think the government is now pushing that number up to maybe a total of $30 billion that they're saying they've recovered through this year. Um, still, that's just really a drop in the bucket compared to, to uh, what is estimated to be lost through fraud and abuse. So, no, I agree. Is it, is it simply a money question, or are we settling these cases without the appropriate prophylactic relief? In other words, corporate integrity agreements that uh, that uh, address uh, address the wrongdoing and uh, case some heed to the lessons learned from these cases. Well, I think corporate integrity agreements are you know, standard operating procedure with the Justice Department when these settlements uh, take place, unless you know otherwise. Uh, well, but Tracy, let me ask you, I mean, and you and uh, Dr. Popkin may have thought about uh, how these cases settle and whether the corporate integrity agreements are appropriate and uh, pay heed to the lessons learned from the cases. What's going on from your perspective? Um, well, we. Ruben and I, and our firm at Grant and Eisenhower, we worked on the Pfizer False Claims Act case, which was a settlement um, of about six or seven different drugs, maybe ten. There were at least six or seven different whistleblowers um, that recovered in that, and it was sort of touted as one of the largest, or maybe is the largest False Claims Act settlement for Medicare, Medicaid, which was at about two point three billion. Um, but when we look at the uh, setting aside the corporate integrity agreement, I mean, $2.3 billion sounds like a lot of money, but, you know, the revenue stream for these drugs, which were widely off-labeled and, and for which many doctors were paid kickbacks to give talks about and to sort of grease the, 
the skids to get these drugs like used for much greater uses than were approved by the FDA. Um, you know, it was a relatively small, small settlement, number one. But number two, when we looked at the corporate integrity agreement, you know, that we were asked to agree to um, for our client and incorporate into, that Pfizer ended up agreeing to, I mean, there were some things that we saw that were really sort of not, <laughs> you know, that we found very distressing about it. Um, for one thing, I think that there was only, as to the doctors that were getting paid kickbacks to do various things to promote the drugs, they weren't going to have to disclose who those doctors were from, from the past, but only going forward. And then I think it started in like July of 2000, whatever, 2009 or 2010. And so it really didn't give anybody in the public uh, any knowledge about who the people were that participated um, in helping to promote these drugs for, for uses that hadn't been studied or that weren't approved by the FDA. And so, I mean, that was one major um, issue. I think the other thing was is that there were you know, we've looked at a lot of other agreements. I mean, we think there can be more uh, stiff uh, <coughs> requirements, like not bonusing reps for off-label sales and sort of things like that. And so I think while the Department of Justice is trying very hard to change behavior and HHS is trying to change behavior, I think this, the corporate integrity agreement is something um, that's not money related, that could be a lot stronger and we could require these companies to divulge information that they have, um, be required to allow the information that the whistleblowers have to become public and, and things like that. They could really give the public mu a much greater understanding of what happened. Um, a lot of times when you see these settlements, people say they're great, but you know, if you talk to the medical community, for example, my, my father's um, wife is a physician and she doesn't understand. I mean, she's very smart. She writes on medical uh, medical issues and um, of the day. And she doesn't really understand what these settlements are about. She doesn't understand what the company has done and, and how they've paid doctors and how they've influenced um, script writing. So one thing that we would like to see um, is a stronger um, you know, corporate integrity agreements that, that provide more information to the Okay, so let's break it down in terms of what's going on. And I know Cyrus, I'm going to get to you in a moment, and Cookie, because Cyrus has experience with corporate integrity agreements, and uh, Dr. Poplin obviously has experience in the medical side. But essentially, uh, the False Claims Act says what all that uh, anybody who files or causes to be filed a false claim for payment or approval where government money is involved, it's being paid out, is liable under the statute. And for trouble damages, supposedly. For trouble damages, okay. So walk me through how a pharmaceutical company, or walk folks through how a pharmaceutical company that off-label markets drugs, meaning that they market a drug for purposes outside the approved indication, and or they pay kickbacks to get the prescriptions written, that is the kickbacks in the form of something subtle, like saying to a doctor, you know, uh, I'll give you a fee to speak, or you can come on this vacation, and we'll teach you how to speak. Walk me through the practices uh, that in cause liability under the statute? Well, kickbacks of all kinds have been one of the big uh, areas of, of uh, violation of the False Claims Act, um, including um, speaking fees, uh, uh, preceptorships, all these you know, ways that they get money to doctors and subtly, uh, psychologically uh, make them feel obligated to help the, uh, the drug reps by pr prescribing their drugs, <clears throat> dinners, uh, trips, etc. Uh, and but, but the real liability may or may not depend on the, uh, the kickback. It may simply be the um, violation of, of the food and drug uh, rules by uh, marketing adulterated product, one that's that's not uh, labeled for the, the use that's being promoted uh, and is beyond the FDA approved labeling. Uh, that, those are the basic liability concepts under the False Claims Act, kickbacks and adulterated product. 
We've had settlements under the False Claims Act involving drugs, Cyprexa, Geodon, Risperdal, Seroquel, uh, and a whole host of drugs amounting to the billions of dollars. And the allegations in these cases have essentially been that the pharmaceutical industry has not only marketed the drug for purposes outside the approved indication, and we also
But here, I'm asking you, how do you re-educate through the settlement agreement with regard to correcting the record about misrepresentations on safety and hazardous safety? Well, just hearing all the other speakers, uh, just a few observations addressing the question. When you really take a step back, the False Claims Act has not reached its full promise and its full potential. And the tension, at least I see in that, is that the mission originally of the, is to focus on collecting money for the taxpayers. So if you're just looking at dollars and cents and leaving dollars back to the U.S. Treasury, which is a very vital mission, the, the Attorney General is missing a more holistic approach to this. And a more holistic approach also understands the public duty to save the public from harm and in the form of their player. And sometimes these are harm to children, the elderly, to various uh, parts of our nation that are put in harm's way because of these dangerous uh, drugs. So to really reach the full potential of false claims, that kind of really to carry out the attorney general mission is to broaden the focus so that it's not just, okay, uh, we've collected X dollars. How many times does the Justice Department say well, we call the quality of false claims out? How about we also save some lives? If you broaden the focus in terms of saving some lives, then an integral part of the settlement would be in the areas of disclosure and transparency uh, and getting quickly out to the medical professionals, for example, uh, to uh, know what, where their patients could be harmed way. In the area of defense industry, could be soldiers being put in harm's way. So unless we broaden the mission to look at how we can protect lives and the mission of bring money into the Treasury Department, we're going to continue to have these more narrow approaches. So I think that one of the key ways of moving forward is greater reporting and transparency. So, so I'd rather, you know, rather than have a panel of, of people just complaining about uh, the system and the way things should be, what I want to ask you is a more pointed question, perhaps focusing in your second area of expertise, which is dealing with the press. When the press sees a settlement that's recorded in a press release by the Department of Justice that says a billion dollars or $425 million, do you think that the press has a greater obligation to its readership than to just say, large settlement today, great job? Or should the press be saying, by the way, what do we know about what the wrongdoing was and what steps are being taken to prevent it? So in other words, is, is there, is there a, can, can we point some fingers, I hate to use that phrase, but can we point some fingers at the media for not being more diligent and asking the right questions? Well, the quick and dirty news story is going to be the dollar figure. So that's where we're going to be focused. So I think part of our role of counsel is to help educate the reporters who are open that there's a far greater public interest uh, set of issues at stake in these cases. So I think it's kind of up to us to help educate them. Because I think left to their own devices, it's just going to be, okay, let's look at that, the dollar figure quickly. Well, let, me ask, report that. let me ask a question, since I practiced law for the first half of my career, but I've practiced medicine since then. Um, don't the companies try to write into the settlement agreements uh, all kinds of gag orders and limitations on what you can say? Well, this is the, this is the question. Um, let, let me sort of throw out a scenario and ask you all to react to this. Uh, in 2010, um, the United States government um, settled a false claims case with the, the company AstraZeneca, which manufactured the drug Seroquel. And uh, Seroquel, Seroquel uh, was a multi-billion dollar a year drug, uh, had a multi-billion dollar revenue stream for, for AstraZeneca. And yet, uh, the allegations, I believe, which were off the market and kickbacks only resulted in a $450 million settlement. In the press release, the Attorney General Eric Holder noted that, um, I believe, 2006, between 2006 and 2008, uh, the company had come forward and told the Department of Justice that you know, it understood that it engaged in some improprieties and wanted to take corrective action. And yet, the case was unsealed in 2010. Um, what I want to ask is, um, is there a problem with these cases remaining under seal for so long without the public knowing about them? And um, as a doctor, I mean, is that a problem perhaps if the medical community knew that the allegations were made and there was some transparency, 
uh, we'd be able to prevent injury and uh, and uh, willy-nilly writing of prescriptions at the at the agency of the complaint. And uh, before I get to Cookie, actually, I, I want to ask Paul and Tracy just quickly: and, and is is there something wrong with showing the defendant a copy of the complaint and then waiting another two years or so before the public gets to see the complaint? I mean, isn't the purpose of the seal? Uh, haven't you really eliminated the purpose of the seal when the defendant is seeing the complaint and the public's not? Well, the primary justification for the seal is to allow the government to conduct an investigation undercover during the early stages of the investigation, contain uh, statements from witnesses, take phone calls, uh, you know, do all the typical undercover operations without the defendant knowing that a case is pending. Um, once the case is partially unsealed, all that's over with. Uh, really, the only thing that remains at that point is this, this point that we've been discussing about settlement leverage and the, and the defendant, the corporation, being able to control the potential drop in its stock price from announcing uh, you know, a, uh, an unresolved, serious claim by the government. So I, I want to now get to Cookie, and I want to repose the question, which I think people might have forgotten. So you have a case. It's filed under seal, which is a requirement of the False Claims Act. But the False Claims Act actually says the seal extends for 60 days and can be renewed. And the practice these days is to continue, continue, to continue to renew the seal. And we have cases where there's allegations of improprieties that impact medical care. Today. And I think the point that Tracy made is the right one. There's another agency involved, and that's the FDA. And as soon as the FDA gets what they call a signal, from anywhere, from the data. They should be getting it, whatever the information that HHS and DOJ have picked up uh, should, be go, should go straight to the FDA. There's nothing, I mean, the FDA can't issue a new warning, can and should. Uh, there's no reason why, I don't think, if, even if the case is under seal, that data about harm to patients or changes that we need to make in medical care or dosing or drug interactions um, that should go straight to the FDA, and the FDA should act. Well, you know, I, I think in terms of mechanics as opposed to sort of a general complaining bitching session, so let me throw out a proposal to you and see how all of you react to it. Um, suppose suppose uh, the Department of Justice um, had guidance, or the judiciary had guidance, where uh, there would be a requirement that uh, once a complaint is filed, the, the relators and the government should file with the court a statement advising the court of whether the allegations uh, uh, you know, uh, involve harm to the public. And if they involve harm to the public, what plan uh, exists to uh, make the public aware of the harm without, without, for example, disclosing the actual existence of the case? Um, do you think that kind of uh, standard order from a court would address some of these issues without interfering with uh, the actual seal itself and the integrity of the investigation. And I guess I pose that to all. Maybe Cyrus, Paul, what do you think? Well, I wonder about you just adding another layer of process that could take a lot of negotiating to figure out. I mean, I would want something that's more automatic that after a year, it gets unsealed. You know, something like that. Because all I'm saying, you need that early investigation time where the defendant's unaware. But once you get, in, get it into the second year, should have done it by then, or you've done it and the company's awarded anyway. So I think something more automatic would, would be better than to have a whole big motion practice when the federal courts are. The Justice Department has a new rule uh, or a recommendation, I don't know if it's a rule. Uh, a memo's been circulated at, uh, in the civil litigation section of the Justice Department uh, advising the the trial attorneys there who are in charge of these cases that they are to make their intervention <clears throat> decisions within nine months after filing of the case. And um, there's been a lot of talk about that amongst members of the uh, Quee Tam Bar, whether that's actually going to happen and what impact it will have on cases. Um, it's just, uh, it's a general uh, suggestion that this is what would be appropriate. Uh, there's no sanction in, involved with it. But uh, I do think the leadership in the Justice Department is attempting to speed up the process. When Once the government makes an intervention decision, 
uh, if it intervenes, the case is unsealed. If it um, declines the case, it is unsealed. So that's the key point when the, the, the public has access to information about the case. And if that intervention decision is speeded up uh, to nine months or a year or whatever it might be, then uh, maybe this problem will be solved. Okay. Well, I see we're running out of time. Uh, any final words from those on the panel? I have one. The one thing we haven't mentioned is the whistleblower. Um, and I thought the seal had something to do with protecting the whistleblower. Well, once the company has figured out that there is a whistleblower and who it is, I mean, their first, their first line of defense is to, is to move the whistleblower out um, as far away from the company as possible and to intimidate them. And once that's already happened, it seems to me the, the reason to have the seal to do the investigations is less compelling. So I know you don't want to comment, but you're singing my song so much, I just have to say, <laughs> all right, I've been under seal for 10 years. I've undergone all kinds of, it, you won't believe, but I also have to tell you the CIAs are not abided by when you report them, nothing happens, and the SEAL is not just for negotiating, the Justice Department actively goes over and tells the hospital how to protect themselves, they can't afford to have a public hospital fail, I'm sorry, they have other motivations that are less than what you're talking about. So sorry, you guys are great. Thank you so much. Okay. I was going to say one thing I called talking about 40% of the fraud is being recovered. And so I think one of the reasons is, is that people are cautious or maybe even afraid to come forward with information. And we started a group about voices for corporate responsibility. It's kind of a home for people to come and talk not about false claims act, but other uh, you know kinds of whistleblower type of you know, venues could be speaking in Congress or things like that, uh, talking to regulators. But when there is an unlikely friend, totally unlikely friend that we have, a favorite whistleblower, which I'm going to say this, and maybe you'll be shocked that I'll say this, but the uh, last 10 years or so, the Supreme Court, you know, under this Roberts Court, has had the most expansive view of retaliation rights under statute after statute. So we actually have uh, more protection. I, I feel compelled to respond to that, absolutely, and, and the reason I feel compelled to respond to that is that, that the Supreme Court has restricted the pleading standards with, as you know, two decisions, Iqbal and Twombly, number one. Um, number two, with regard to the pharmaceutical cases, uh, they have uh, they issued a decision called uh, Sorrell versus Vermont, which is sort of a decision that didn't get a lot of play in the press. Um, and it came down at the, the April 26 of 2011. And in the Sorrell case, the state of Vermont had promulgated a statute which barred, uh, which, which barred the uh, sale by pharmacies and hospitals and insurance companies of uh, prescription writing data uh, to pharmaceutical companies for the purposes of marketing. And this is the IMS data that the marketers actually use to target the doctors and detail the doctors. And for those of us who do pharmaceutical fraud cases, we all know that, that if you eliminate uh, the pharmaceutical company's use of denying this data, it actually it takes a lot out of their, uh, a lot of wind out of their sales in terms of their ability to off-label market the drugs because they can't pick out which doctors to select to be the opinion leaders for the speeches they give and who to pay the kickbacks to and so forth. And curiously, uh, the Supreme Court uh, said that this was not a mere regulation of commercial speech. It, it uh, said that this was, it, it, it applied a heightened uh, standard uh, to the speech, protected the speech, and threw out the Vermont statute as unconstitutional. So at least in the pharmaceutical area, the Supreme Court, and curiously, Judge Sotomayor was in the majority, but Judge Breyer wrote the, the dissent, uh, the uh, Supreme Court was protective of the pharmaceutical industry. No, I'm not saying that the Supreme Court isn't over and over and over again protective of business, big business against individuals dismantling substantive rights, but there is one countercurrent, which is in the narrow area of retaliation. Well, I, 
and so I'll throw out one more that's actually on point with retaliation cases, and I believe the Supreme Court's decision in Gross, where you have a mixed motive case, and we had a mixed motive discrimination case, the, uh, the, uh, once the plaintiff made out a prima facie case, the burden uh, then switched to the defendant to come forward with uh, evidence justifying its conduct. Well, that's a substantive right. It's retaliation right is a, it is a separate right. That's my, that's my point. I see I'm substantive point. rights that are weakening the law for the employees and the workers. Well, I, I defer to you as my expert. Okay. Okay. I'm just saying, look at the Northern <laughs> Railroad and a whole string of cases where they have, um, even in areas that were um, open, unresolved areas that you would have thought that would come out the wrong way, they've actually come out in favor of the employee in that very narrow area of being able to stand up for your rights and retaliation. Now, the irony of it the trend down the road, there'll be no substantive rights left. But if you stand behind one of those statutes and have no substantive rights, you can you get retaliated against. You can do something about that. Okay, well, I thank you all for coming, and uh, I guess I should look forward to the next panel, which should be.